OK, so for question 1. Chlorine gas, Cl2, can be produced by reacting hydrochloric acid with potassium manganate 7. Use the standard electrode potentials shown below to answer the following questions. Write an ionic equation for the reaction that occurs between hydrochloric acid and manganate 7 ions. OK, so for this question, which is a classic A-level exam question, what we need to do is first identify the species being oxidised and the species being reduced in the overall reaction between the two. So these standard electrode potentials on the right-hand side are the key to this first part of the question. The more positive a standard electrode potential, the more likely reduction is to take place, and the more negative the electrode potential, the less likely reduction is to occur, and so the more likely oxidation is to occur. So with the information we've been given, we can see that the standard electrode potential for the MnO4-, minus, the manganate 7 ions, is more positive than the standard electrode potential for the chlorine positive 1.52 compared to positive 1.36. This tells us that the MnO4- reaction will be the reduction, and therefore the Cl2 reaction will be the oxidation. This is really, really important, because what this now tells us is that the MnO4- ions are going to be reduced and go to Mn2 plus ions, but for oxidation to occur for the chlorine half equation, Cl minus ions must be oxidized and form Cl2 molecules. What I would advise we do at this stage of the question then is to rewrite out the two half equations in the direction that they are actually occurring. So first of all, we know that the reduction reaction is going to be MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5E minus going to form Mn2 plus and 4H2O. Boom, lovely and straightforward. For the chlorine, however, we know that oxidation is taking place, so it's the reverse direction. This means Cl minus ions are being oxidized to half Cl2 plus E minus. Great. So what this tells us then is that the MnO4- ions gain electrons that have been lost by the Cl minus. So if one mole of MnO4- gains five electrons and one mole of Cl minus can release one mole of electrons, this means we need five lots of chloride ions to give us the five electrons that we need for the MnO4- minus reduction. So we need to times this chlorine equation by five. So we now have five Cl- minus producing two and a half Cl2 plus 5e minus. If we combine these two half equations together then, we end up with MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5e minus plus 5Cl minus going to form Mn2 plus plus 4H2O plus 2.5Cl2 plus 5e minus. Now notice here that the 5e minus on the left and on the right can be cancelled out. Boom, boom. So this would leave us with MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5Cl minus goes to Mn2 plus plus 4H2O plus 2.5 Cl2. OK, on to question B. A student tries to produce chlorine gas by adding sodium chloride to a solution of potassium manganate 7. Explain with reference to relevant half equations why no reaction will occur. This is a really sneaky little question, this. So to answer this one, we need to think about the species that we've got present. Well, sodium chloride, if it's added to a solution, will dissociate and it will split apart into Na plus and Cl minus ions. Now, the sodium ions we aren't interested in anyway because they aren't involved in the half equations, but the Cl minus ions are. Great, we know we've got Cl minus ions, which we know need to be oxidized to make the chlorine gas. Great, no problem there. 
We also know that because we're told it's a solution of potassium manganate 7, that's KMnO4 aqueous, which again dissociates into solution to give us K plus plus MnO4 minus. We know the MnO4 minus is what's needed to be reduced. So all looking good. So why is no reaction going to happen? Well, if we look at the half equation for the reduction of the MnO4 minus, we need H plus ions. We need to have an acid present to provide for H plus ions for that reduction half equation. Now, if we just have a solution of KmnO4 and NaCl, we don't have any H plus ions. So no H plus ions are present, meaning the reduction of MnO4 minus can't happen. OK, on to the next question. An electrochemical cell was set up by combining the half cells shown below. Calculate the EMF of the cell under standard conditions. OK, well, to tackle this question, we need to first of all remind ourselves what we mean by EMF or electromotive force. It's basically what we call the E cell. So the total potential difference across the cell between the two electrodes in each half cell. That sounds way more complicated than it actually is. To calculate the E cell, we take the electropotential of the reduction half cell and we subtract the electrode potential of the oxidation half cell. So reduction minus oxidation. Now remember, the more positive the standard electrode potential, the more likely reduction is to occur. The more negative the standard electrode potential, the more likely oxidation is to occur. So the E reduction is the most positive and the E oxidation is the most negative. So what we're really doing here is we're subtracting the most negative from the most positive. So in this situation, the copper is the most positive And the zinc is the most negative. So this gives us then E cell equals positive 0 0.34 volts subtract minus 0 0.76 volts, which gives us a final value of positive 1.10 volts. So the EMF or E cell value is positive 1.10 volts. OK, so that's part A. On to part B. A student suggests the copper containing half cell is the anode. Explain whether they are correct, referring to standard electrode potentials in your answer. OK, so in this situation, we again need to remind ourselves that E cell equals E reduction minus E oxidation. Now, remember, in electrochemistry, the cathode is always the electrode where reduction takes place. And the anode is always the electrode where oxidation takes place. Now, this is always the same regardless of whether you have a voltaic cell or whether you have an electrolytic cell like for electrolysis at GCSE. Cathode is reduction, anode is oxidation. So if the copper is the anode, that would mean the copper is oxidized. But we can see here that the copper is the more positive value of the two, so that means the copper will be reduced. It won't be oxidized, meaning the copper is the cathode and the zinc, therefore, is the anode. So the Cu is reduced, so that means cathode, because... The electropotential of the CuCu2 plus positive than the electropotential for the zinc half cell. So the answer, no. The student is incorrect. OK, final question. Ships made of iron often have blocks of zinc attached to their sides to prevent corrosion of iron. Using the standard electrode potentials below, explain how the zinc anodes protect the iron from corroding. 
Well, the key idea behind this question is that on the bottom of the ship, you actually set up a simple electrochemical cell because you've got your solid zinc in contact with the salt solution of the water and you have the solid iron in contact with the salt solution as well. So you have this like electrochemical cell. Now, if we have a look at the electropotentials we've been given, we can see that the iron is more positive at only minus 0.44 volts, so more positive, and the zinc is more negative at minus 0.76 volts. So this means then that the more positive half cell of the iron is more likely to undergo reduction and the more negative half cell of the zinc is more likely to undergo oxidation. So what's actually going to happen is you're going to have a situation where if you can imagine the bottom of your ship is solid iron in the water. Da -da 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 -da. So let's say this is solid Fe. And you have a zinc block attached. Obviously, the zinc isn't nearly as big as this. <laughs> we'll pretend we've got this big zinc block here. What's actually going to happen that because zinc is effectively more reactive and the standard electropotential is more negative for zinc than iron, the solid piece of zinc is actually going to be negatively charged compared to the iron, which is going to be more positively charged. So this means oxidation is going to occur at the zinc and reduction is going to occur at the surface of the iron. The iron therefore will be the cathode and the zinc will be the anode. Well, in order for iron to corrode, the iron has to be oxidized, meaning the iron would have to be the anode. But in this situation, the iron becomes the cathode, and so it won't undergo oxidation. Now, there are several different ways you could actually write an answer to this. But the key idea is you have to get in four main points. First of all, the fact that an electrochemical cell will be established between the solid zinc and iron and the salt water. The second point will come from the fact you're saying the electrode potential of the zinc half cell is more negative than the electropotential of the iron half cell. As a result, zinc will be the anode and iron will be the cathode. This means solid zinc will oxidize, but solid iron won't or is unable to, meaning the solid iron won't undergo corrosion.